If you want to know what real feature development is going on with Star Citizen, this development update is meant to give you the highlights. From interesting new AI abilities to life support and gravity generation gameplay, this report has an interesting amount of player facing improvements in development for the future. I'm actually out of town for this report, so it'll be a bit more condensed than usual. But I'll make sure to link the full report down below if you want to follow along. Make sure to get involved in my giveaway linked down below to win an Aegis Saber. And thank you for coming to my Tomato Talk. Let's start with some AI content development. Throughout the AI segment today, you're going to hear a lot of things that sound like proper game elements. It's another reminder of where the studio finally is in this game development process, and they're exciting things to hear. Along with creating some new usables and interaction points for medical personnel and hospital rooms, the content team continued to improve general locomotion realism by categorizing NPC actions by frequency. So coughs or sneezes might play 10% of the time, head stretches might play 40% of the time, and something like checking their Moby glass might only be 30% of the time. This will be triggered by certain scenarios, so the likelihood of a player actually seeing this stuff happen is vastly lower than these percentages suggest. Now on to AI features development. Last month, the team worked on the traits system, a way for AI to be categorized into specific action groups. Through this, the team has developed cautious AI attackers who hang back and act a little more timid, aggressive AI attackers who might rush you, medics who heal, gunners who prefer using turrets, and addicts who use any stimulant they can find when it's available. The behavior system was also expanded on from last month's report, with AI characters gaining the ability to search rooms and floors together, passing off information to clear an area more quickly and realistically. A new system was implemented using firing tokens, an artificial currency made by the developers that allows any AI engaging a target to only attack if they have in their possession one of these firing tokens. With a token limit determined by the devs, this allows easy tailor-made combat encounters that don't get too overwhelming except in special cases, by limiting the amount of AI that can be attacking you at once. AI perception was also expanded, and a new sixth sense perception range was developed. This creates a close proximity area that AI can detect you in over time, as a person might in real life if you were sneaking up behind them. All of these features being developed are due to the maturing nature of the teams involved. It's been a long time for communication to improve and schedules to start flowing. It's good to note that just about everything AI related we're hearing about is combat focused. All of this is Squadron 42 development that will make it to the PU sometime later, hopefully beginning next year. We aren't even starting to see true cargo salvage or even main social behaviors and traits yet. On the ship art team where we get most of our ship news in these reports, the Argo SRV continued through the gray box phase. An unannounced ship continued through final art, getting pretty close to an art side completion status. Another unannounced vehicle, this one of the ground flavor, passed its final review and also is nearing completion. The art side of the resource management pass on the hammerhead continued, with a new gravity generator room being added with new component bays as well. Work on the Misk Hull C continued, but not much more is known than that. The Drake Corsair continued through final art with the exterior receiving its polish, and the Drake Vulture received support. Considering this ambiguous statement in the update, I'm going to assume this is mainly emotional. Ah, my good friend the engine section, of which most I understand not. Let's get into it. The physics team has been working hard at code optimization, focusing on reducing loading times and memory consumption. The rendering team continued on the Gen 12 implementation, with the render to texture pipeline being enabled through Gen 12 by default, and MIP map generations, gas clouds, processing, and forward and tile forward rendering were transitioned. Atmospheric rendering was moved to Gen 12, and volumetric cloud renderings is being wrapped up. After that, rendering for clouds in general will begin to be worked on and improved for the players. 
That's all kind of big news. Getting these major features transitioned over to the new, more efficient Gen 12 renderer could lead to some performance improvements in the near future. Okay, features. The Arena Commander features team progressed with improvements to both modules. This is pretty good. As the persistent universe becomes more real and more risky, these two modules will be the best place to learn all the basics of the game and understand how to defend yourself if need be. The characters and weapons feature team had some great locomotion improvements last month. Support for midpoint ladder entry was added so that single ladders can service multiple floors like are in some ships. The team then took the opportunity to further develop ladder functionality with 360 degree views when stationary, allowing players to jump from ladders and early exploration of item use while on ladders. The gameplay features team worked on the resource network, making sure the Hammerhead and Hull A networks lined up with the vehicle features team we'll hear about a little later. They also started looking at early work for the Crusader Ares and similar sized ships resource networks. There's also an interesting comment in the report about small items which use ship power. I never considered that even small use items might be considered in resource management, but it looks like it'll be an important part of running and maintaining an outpost. Also, work on life support was finished and salvage gameplay is in the QA test phase. The mission features team began investigating how to lessen the impact of crime stats obtained through bugs, removing the attack on site designation from level 1 and 2 crime stats, also allowing them to land at stations to pay off their fines. Providing this doesn't cause problems, it'll be live soon. A very good change considering the possible difficulties this could have made for unknowing newcomers and even players caught by glitches during solo play. A new complex investigation mission entered the prototyping phase, and the upcoming major update to Bounty Hunting received design and foundation work. The vehicle features team focused on ship MFDs and ship UI systems, nailing down the detailed designs needed for different on-screen elements we might see. The team also worked with the gameplay features team on the resource network system, integrating the power and coolant systems with various ship features to make sure that the ship systems react to our internal conditions and they improve the design of the whole overall system. This is a huge part of the game receiving incremental work each month in these updates. It's really cool to finally be tuned into the progress on the resource network. In the graphics department, the damage map tech for salvage is running and in the bug fixing phase. This is a big piece of tech being introduced into the game alongside salvage. Plenty of optimizations were worked on regarding Gen 12, CPU offloading of planet tech code, volumetric fog rendering, and other graphics updates. The EU Sandbox team spent the month building outlaw variants of the new outposts and whiteboxing new modules like landing areas, refineries, habs, and ore extractors, all of which will absolutely be used by players at some point in the future. Whitebox work also went into upcoming space locations for ship-based exploration gameplay. The EU Landing Zone team progressed a lot on the main pyro location, Ruin Station with work progressing on the cold side routes, other interior locations, side entrances, and shantytown habitations. Work was also done on the revamped underground facilities. Pre-production began on new law and bounty offices, which will act as mission pickup and drop-off points for the upcoming major bounty hunting addition. The Montreal locations team debugged and polished the new Damar derelict coming up, and updated existing locations. The work on Lorville's update has reached the gray box phase and building interiors kicked off work that will bring a massive amount more space to cities around the game. The narrative teams worked a lot on mission design last month with many of the expansions we've heard discussed for 318. The team also finished a full text pass on the new mission type we learned about in last month's report after playing through an in-game prototype. It's nice to see all the work going into new missions this year.
The new Interactables team we met for the first time back in June on Star Citizen Live completed prototyping deployable props that will probably be pretty useful with persistence coming up. Next will be new updates to the harvestables and consumables systems with new options. Snowpiercer over here. But they better skip the sound effects. The Montreal Tools team updated Mighty Bridge to add new functionalities for planetary location creation. They also are nearing completion on the first procedural location creation tool. This will allow teams to create space stations in minutes, allowing for more variety and faster rollout of the locations. They also approached their final push on the derelict settlement procedural creation tool, with the goal to be an 80% procedural workflow with artists touching up the last 20%. This should reduce turnaround on the locations from months to weeks. The online services team in Montreal spent a lot of time preparing for Alpha 318 and persistent entity streaming, as well as the new login flow. All of this was discussed on Inside Star Citizen a few weeks ago, and I went into more depth with it last week, but it sounds like there's still work to be done, with internal demos just now starting for some services. The UI team continued pushing forwards with features for the new star map, last month seemingly three-dimensional text and shaders for space clouds. These downstream focuses hopefully means the feature itself is reaching a viable level. Concepts were also developed for terminal screens around the universe, and preparation was done for persistent entity streaming. Last month, the concept art team continued iterating on quantum travel effects, and the effects team added effects to new derelict spaceships. Finally, work continued on salvage effects, specifically the hull stripping laser. This report had a lot of great info in it, from improved new player experiences to a massive amount of new gameplay and missions being worked on. The fact that these monthly reports are so feature-centric rather than ship-centric is why I enjoy them, I think. This is the meat of the game development, and if you want to see how this game keeps developing over time, check out this playlist that I have that'll show all the monthly reports, and maybe consider subscribing to the channel for all the news and updates coming in the next few months. And make sure to get into my current giveaway for a special Aegis Saber, along with a copy of Star Citizen. I hope you learned something new in this report, and I'll catch you in the next.